My name is Kaylee Jean Edwards, and I have schizophrenia. This is my story. I haven't always had schizophrenia. In fact, next year I'll reach the milestone of having lived half of my life with hallucinations. It's a weird milestone to celebrate, yes, but I take what life gives me. I was born in the winter of 1993, remarkably free of the ability to see two realities at once. But that doesn't mean my childhood was unremarkable. Among my earliest childhood memories is a game I used to play with my dad. Whenever we went grocery shopping, he would show me how much cash he was going to give the cashier, and then I would race the cash register to tell him how much change he was going to get back. Yeah, maybe that's like not everybody's idea of a game. <laughs> now, if that example didn't make it clear, I was one of those annoying, overachieving students in school. I skipped a grade. I was top of my class. I went to a special math and science program. And then when I came home and finished my homework, I would stay up late into the night teaching myself how to draw, teaching myself languages, just wiki walking, learning as much stuff as I could possibly stuff into my brain. Just to be crystal clear, I'm not saying all of this as some sort of weird flex. It's who I was, and part of who I still am today. And I honestly don't think I would still be here if I didn't have that part of me. In 2009, I became a high school senior. I was dealing with a lot of depression around that time because I felt so different from everyone else, and it was lonely. I had no idea that that feeling was about to get a lot worse. Allow me to set the scene, as it were. I was in the living room, holding a glass of water. My family was watching Friends on TV. I was debating whether I wanted to stay and watch with them or go back to my room and draw. You know, moody 16-year-old girl stuff. And then I looked to the left, out the front door, and outside, I saw a woman. She had dark hair, about as long as mine, and she wore this white A-line dress with little blue flowers on it and short puffy sleeves. But her most notable feature was her lack of eyes. And I don't mean that her face was smooth where her eyes were supposed to be. No, rather I mean there were huge gaping flesh holes where her eyes were supposed to be. Now that part of my childhood home had a really open layout. Anybody in the living room had direct line of sight to the door, and the door had a giant pane of glass in it, so it was glaringly obvious if anyone was standing there, especially if they were standing there menacingly. So I looked at my family. The dogs weren't barking. My parents weren't acting like they saw a weird, creepy stranger at the door, even if they looked right at it. So I just went back to my room quickly, as quickly as I could, because my bedroom overlooked the patio that she was standing on. So I thought if I hurried, I could get a better look at her from a different angle. If only I could just get to my bed quickly. But by the time I got there, she was gone. I was depressed, lonely. And I thought I could see ghosts. What a recipe for success. And before anyone says, when life gives you lemons, have you ever tried to make lemonade out of lemons that weren't real? Due to the stigma, I felt like I couldn't tell anybody 
I'd seen enough horror movies to know that the person who randomly starts seeing ghosts is never taken seriously. And, well, if it wasn't ghosts, that was even worse. Every depiction of mental illness that I had seen at that point was extremely negative. If you were hearing voices, that meant you were psychotic and you deserved to be locked up. And in media, if you were psychotic, that meant you were a killer. I had no success stories to look up to. None that I'd seen. I didn't see any option but to hide it and keep going. During my last year of high school, the woman with no eyes came back. And she brought friends of all forms. They were relentless. I could barely sleep. These were the conditions I was living in. I made myself ignore it as best as I could. And eventually I did graduate high school. I remember thinking that things would get better after that. But I'm not so lucky. I studied computer science at Michigan Technological University. And this part of the video was really hard to write because I honestly don't remember a lot from that time. And by that, I don't mean to say, oh, it was all a blur. There were points where I literally wasn't making new memories. I have gaps that are months long. At least that means this section will be pretty short, huh? What I do know is that the delusions crept deeper into my mind. The hallucinations got fiercer, smarter. I stopped being able to hide it. At one point, I was convinced that the water fountains on campus were poisoned, and I doubted that enough to not force it upon anyone else. But. I did let it impact my own water intake. Yet another time, I was convinced that the sun was going to explode. I doubted it just enough to make myself study for exams, you know, just in case it didn't happen, but not enough to fully dismiss the possibility. So here I was, stumbling around, chronically terrified, not able to remember much of anything, and super dehydrated for years. Of course people noticed. <laughs> It was very silly of me to think that perhaps people would not notice. <laughs> but the only help available to me was the free counseling through the university. Notably, I am discounting the time that I was charged thousands of dollars to be traumatized at a hospital. Given that that was the opposite of helpful, I'm sure you understand. One of the counselors was convinced that I was just extremely anxious even though I did tell him that I was hallucinating constantly. Last I checked, that's not a symptom of general anxiety. Or else everyone would be doing it, am I right? So, questionable diagnosis. But what do I know? I didn't go to school for that. He just wasn't listening to me. He just had to be right. And that wasn't helpful at all. In fact, it was harmful. So, I just stopped going. Eventually, a romantic partner of mine convinced me to go back and request another counselor. And I'm actually glad that I did. That counselor actually listened to me. To the point that he ordered that written diagnostic test and had me take it. I still remember sitting in his office, waiting for the results. He made it clear that he was legally not allowed to diagnose me. But he was legally allowed to tell me that the tests indicated a strong potential for schizophrenia. More than anything, I was relieved. Finally, I had a name for this thing that was growing inside of me. And that meant that I had a fighting chance. And that's what got me through to college graduation. Somehow, I'd graduated, with honors no less, a BS in computer science, with minors in art 
an international German. And I had a job lined up immediately. So in 2016, I packed my bags and moved to good old Minnesota to join the workforce. I got my first solo apartment where I lived with my cat, who's pretty cool. And after months of saving up, I was able to get help. Actual, tangible help. For those not keeping track, at this point it had been seven years since my symptoms first manifested. That's how long it took me to get actual help. Something something medical system broken. I started seeing a therapist, and that was over seven years ago, and I still see her. So I got pretty lucky. I also started seeing a psychiatrist who gave me a formal diagnosis. Schizophrenia, paranoid subtype, with depression and anxiety. Which, I mean, like, of course. <laughs> like, of course. <laughs> Of course I have depression and anxiety. Imagine having lived my life up until this point and not having depression or anxiety. <laughs> Laughable. <laughs> anyway, diagnosis means medication. And boy, did I start and stop a lot of medications. That was a long and bumpy road. With the biggest bump being that I am apparently allergic to Cymbalta. <laughs> And by allergic to Cymbalta, I mean, it makes me pass out. <laughs> I'm just going to let that set the general tone of my medication journey. By the way, if you're interested in hearing more about that or anything else that I've talked about in this video, please leave a comment below so that I know what to make more videos about. I made this channel to talk about personal development through the lens of somebody who is currently conquering their schizophrenia which is apparently nigh unheard of. And as part of that, my hope is that I can destigmatize schizophrenia a little bit, make it a little less scary. And because of that, I'm an open book. So if there's anything you want to know, please just ask. I'd be happy to make a video about it. Just make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss them. Anyway, back to medication talk. While I was dealing with all the side effects of these medications, which by the way, did not magically fix everything. I still had to go to work. <laughs> By that point, my memory loss had resolved itself, but that time period was still blurry. And I totally blame Latuda for that. I've shown up to work through severe insomnia and hypersomnia. I've worked through anxiety attacks and symptoms like chronic nausea. And my schizophrenia symptoms weren't gone. So I worked through those two. This is also, of course, all layered on top of the stressors of normal life. I had to take care of my pets. I still had friends and I had to maintain those relationships. And speaking of relationships, yeah, I was dating. Do I question the wisdom of that decision? Yes. Yes, I do. But I'm a person too. I get lonely, just like everyone. And I want to be loved, just like everyone. So I can't really blame myself for trying, even though it mostly just brought me pain. Really, most things were bringing me pain. And it must have been really obvious, because everyone certainly questioned my life decisions. But what nobody can tell me is what they would have done differently if they were dealt the hand that I was. As sad as it is, you need money to exist in the United States of America. It's considered immoral to not have money. Just look at how people treat the homeless. It's considered a personal failure to be on disability, even though everybody is one accident away from having to rely on it. I've done what I've done just so that I could have a chance at a normal, and worthy life. I have clawed my way through every obstacle, punched down every barrier put in front of me, both the ones manifested by my own mind and the ones put in front of me by other human beings. I have carved my place in this world with my own bare hands. 
because that's the only way I was ever going to make it. In my experience, the people who are quickest to point out my lack of default worth have never had to train themselves to ignore hallucinations. They've never been stabbed in the middle of a meeting and had to pretend everything's fine because they knew that nobody else could see the bloodshed. And I would put money on the fact that they never had to pretend to be another person just so that they could sleep at night. And that's not even counting the things that other people have forced upon me. The discrimination, the stigma, the judgment, and in some cases, the violence. But yeah, maybe I haven't done enough. I've done everything I can, but maybe it's still not enough. Because I will never be able to make people see me through a lens of empathy. As a human being instead of a monster. When people tell me that I should just lie down and be grateful for what I do have because it's more than other people like me, all I can see is how stark that inequality is. You see, I'm a damn good engineer. And for years, I've seen people be less productive than me, less innovative, less adaptable, get less results. And still, they get more. The difference that I see is that they are not schizophrenic women. I have trained myself to exceed expectations by all measures. Because when you are working against something as strong and powerful as the stigma against schizophrenia, you have to be perfect. And that perfectionism only nets me what the most mediocre of straight white men would get. If that. And you may be wondering if this is all just in my head. A delusion of grandeur. And that's fair. I ask myself that every day. But I have systems in place to measure such things. I have brought this up to all the relevant people I can think of my therapist, my friends, co-workers, and they all see it too. It's real. And that's what breaks my heart, because I could live with it if it was a delusion, but it's not. It's real. And if I can be an immaculate genius and still be met with such restriction, what about schizophrenic people who can't do that? What do they get? Nobody should have to be perfect to live in a society. And yet the only reason I have success at all is because I somehow hold myself to a standard higher than that of a god. Nobody should have to do that. But I've had to. I've spent so many years doing what I've had to do to survive. An adrenaline rush that's lasted almost half of my life. One that could have been prevented if people didn't make my life any harder than it ever had to be. And when you're getting all of your energy from pure survival, that can destroy you. Let's fast forward to 2023. The start of the year was pretty bad. I was in yet another emotionally abusive relationship. As it turns out, when you've spent your entire life having to second-guess everything you see, hear, and think, gaslighting is super effective. (laughs) But it turned out that my gut was right. I was right to be afraid of him. And when it was all over... I had to unpack how harmful it can be to let somebody else distort reality for you and just how susceptible my condition makes me to that. After that sank in, things started to line up for me. I was in contact with the right people at the right time. 
for once. One, a mentor of mine. Someone I never really had to fight for. He was just kind of there. And he said a lot of things that I needed to hear at the time I needed to hear them. With the kindness and patience of a saint, I might add. That kind of guidance is really hard to come by, especially for someone like me. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to adequately express just how grateful I am and how much that meant to me. But that won't stop me from trying. He helped me realize that I wasn't seeing things clearly because I was just surviving. I had never thought about what I actually wanted out of life because I never had the luxury. I was just going, moving forward without any sort of intention. Around the same time, another mentor asked me a question that would change my life. She was giving me career advice, and she asked if you could solve any problem in the world, which one would it be? She encouraged me not to be afraid to think big, but I already was, and I admittedly, rudely, interrupted her with words that spilled straight out of my core. I never want anyone to have to go through anything like I have, all alone. After the words left my mouth, they were all I could think about. How could I, a lone schizophrenic woman, accomplish that goal? And yet, the more I turned it over in my mind, the more alive I felt. I never really wanted to be alive. And I tried to remedy that more than a few times. This feeling was all I've ever known. It's the reason that I was moving forward with no intention. I was alive against my will. But one night, I was lying in bed, thinking about all the possibilities, the strategies I could employ to work toward the goal of fighting loneliness. And I felt a gentle warmth radiating from within. A warmth I'd never felt before. I didn't know what it was at the time, but now, I think it was peace. And ever since I felt that feeling, I've wanted to be here. I've wanted to be alive. And that is the power of purpose. So I ran those ideas by trusted people in my life. And to my surprise, they all thought I could do it. Some even said it felt natural, like it's why I'm here in the first place. And they reminded me of my strengths, the wisdom that I've gained on my journey, the resilience the adaptability. All reasons they thought I could do it. People outside of myself believed in me. And that's huge. As I've hinted at throughout this video, I heavily depend on the assessments of people that I trust to make sure that I'm seeing things clearly. That's how I fight schizophrenia. And those who support me, which includes members of my medical team, helped me to realize that sometimes I see things more clearly than people who don't have schizophrenia. This isn't because I'm great or special. It's purely circumstance. 
everybody experiences delusions on some level. Everybody has character flaws, blind spots, and biases. Mine just aren't as widely accepted. I've worked extremely hard to overcome my internal biases, purely because being schizophrenic has such steep societal consequences. Turns out, my drive to ensure that madness does not rule my life means that I've spent far more time developing myself, staying informed, and expanding my worldview than the average person. Like I said, it's all circumstance. And standing at the end of those circumstances is me. Finally, I had validation that I didn't just have metaphorical dirt under my fingernails to show for all of my hardship. I had something tangible. Something I could work with. That was the final piece that I needed to truly grow into myself. There's a lot of me in here, and I've always been afraid of that. But now I know I don't have to be. It's just proof that I'm used to taking the road less traveled, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm quite used to forging my own path. So I know that even if my goal is truly unattainable, I still need to try. Schizophrenia can ravage you. It created an enemy out of my own mind that hisses lies into my ears and presents falsehoods before my very eyes. And in response, people tend to treat me like an alien or a monster. Many use my disorder as an excuse not to listen, an excuse to dismiss my pain, an excuse to not treat me as a person because that reality is too uncomfortable. But I am a person. I deserve to be here just as much as anyone else does. The fact that I had to figure out something as complicated as determining what reality is all on my own for so long is a tragedy. The fact that I still feel less alone when I'm completely isolated isn't my fault. It's the result of the masses turning their fear of the unknown into hatred. And finally, the fact that I am still here to tell this story is both a testament to my strength and my luck. I will never claim to be perfect, but at least now I know I'm myself. I am more than my schizophrenia. I'm a writer. I'm a singer. I'm an engineer. I'm a pet owner. An auntie. A woman. And most of all, I'm a human being. One that finally has hope in her heart. Hope for me. And hope for you. I think hope is the second most beautiful four-letter word bested only by love. And frankly, the two can't exist without each other, as they do inside me. I didn't put all of this on the internet for pity or sympathy. I did it for awareness, a data point we can use as we move forward to make the world a better place for everyone. And also to let people know that they're not alone. I've realized that despite every reason I might have to hate people, no matter how justified that might be, I don't. I can't. I still love humanity. Every day, I look around and see pain in the hearts of so many. I can hear it in my friends' voices when they say, that they hate people. They're hurt. Just like me. 
We're all more alike than we'd like to admit. I honestly don't know a lot of people with schizophrenia. But I do know a heck of a lot of people who have struggled to get through life. And nobody should have to navigate the darkness alone. Let's do it together. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. It means the world to me. But this is just the beginning. More videos are coming, so please subscribe so you don't miss them. You can also follow me on social media at Kaylee J. Edwards or on my blog, KayleeJEdwards.com, for updates as I grow and continue to expand my content and my other offerings. Now, I talk about a lot of hard things, things that people tend to shy away from, and it's important to talk about those things because no problem ever gets solved by ignoring it. However, it can be overwhelming when you feel like there's only darkness around you. It's important to remember that there is light. This is my jar of joy. I fill it with positive things as a reminder that good does exist in this world. It doesn't take away from all the work we still need to do as a species, but it lives alongside it. To get a full view of reality, we need to be informed about everything. And that includes the bright spot. Let's take one out, shall we? Gotta give it a good mix. All right. It's funny. It's funny that I got this one. MTU alumni at Consumers Energy are leading clean initiatives. As I stated earlier in this very video, I am an MTU alum. I went to Michigan Tech, graduated with a computer science degree, and I was scrolling on their online blog magazine, and I found this article. I'll flash the article up on the screen here, but the gist is that Consumers Energy is a power company in Michigan, and apparently there are five MTU alumni in positions of power there, and they're really driving these clean energy initiatives. I believe I remember reading that they are closing their coal power plants way faster than any other power company in the country. If I'm misremembering that, I'll, I'll correct it in post, but I believe that's what I remember reading. And that's fantastic. We love to see it. And I think it's a really good example of how when you put people who know what they're doing and care in positions of power, really good stuff happens. And yeah, I, I, I did feel a little bit of a uh, husky pride in my heart. <laughs> Thank you again for watching. I hope your day brings you happiness and light. And I'll see you again soon. Bye now. Thank you.